Good afternoon and welcome everybody to the Cato Institute. I'm Ian Vasquez. I direct the Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity here at Cato. The title and the style of the book we are featuring today, Socialism Sucks, is admittedly more irreverent than the typical more staid uh, public policy books that we usually organize events around here at Cato. But I can assure you that the authors that uh, we are featuring today are serious, accomplished economists whose decades of scholarly work inform this publication. The subtitle of the book, Two Economists Drink Their Way Through the Unfree World, gives a flavor of their unconventional approach uh, for a couple of academics. That subtitle didn't surprise me, though. I tend to run into Ben Powell and Bob Lawson at uh, economic or academic conferences around the country and around the world, and inevitably they have drinks in their hands, uh, probably because we, we chat at event receptions, hotel bars, and the like. But the conversation is always interesting, informative, and fun. And that's also true of this new book. This is a light book about a heavy topic. So it's fortunate that, uh, for, fortuitous rather, that uh, we are featuring it today on the birthday of the late Nobel laureate Milton Friedman, one of the greatest economists of the 20th century and a champion of economic and overall human freedom. Uh, we were lucky to uh, have known him and uh, for some of us to have worked with him to a limited degree. I'm sure he too would agree with the title of the book, though I can't really recall him ever uh, putting his opposition to socialism in quite those terms. <laughs> Today, socialism has gained an appeal uh, among some Americans, especially young Americans, as a viable alternative to a market economy and to this market economy that uh, has prevailed and characterized the United States. This is so much the case that leading political candidates and others openly espouse their admiration for the ideology and the policies that it implies. Yet how much do Americans really understand about socialism, and are there aspects of its appeal that are well-founded? One of the goals of the authors of Socialism Sucks is to disabuse readers of any idealism that they may have for the ideology by appealing to reality and direct uh, observation that most readers can relate to, rather than by relying on reams of data, statistics, and other empirical uh, hard evidence uh, that are so damning in and of themselves, but also dry compared to the approach they take in this book. They achieve this by traveling to places where real socialism has been put in place, Cuba, North Korea, Venezuela, for example. Along the way, they also visit other countries that have experienced socialism or are said to be uh, socialist and explain through anecdotes and observation how those systems really work. The end result, hopefully, is to dispose of any romantic notions of socialism. That the authors felt uh, that they needed to write such a book is a reflection of our polarized times where extreme ideologies on the left and the right are having far more of a sway among the American public than was imaginable even a few short years ago. We will also be discussing why that has been the case and what else we might do about it. But let's, the, let's uh, let the authors tell their stories and we'll begin uh, by hearing from Ben Powell and uh, Bob Lawson and then uh, by comments from Matt Kibbe. Uh, ben Powell is the director of the Free Market Institute and a professor of economics in the Jerry S. Rawls College of Business Administration at Texas Tech University. He is the North American editor of the Review of Austrian Economics. He's been the past president of the Association of Private Enterprise Education and a senior fellow with the Independent Institute. He is a number of, uh, he's the author of a number of books, including Out of Poverty, published by Cambridge University Press, and Making Poor uh, Nations Rich, published by Stan Stanford University Press, 
His research fi <coughs> findings have been reported in more than 100 popular press outlets, such as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Bob Lawson is the professor of practice and Jerome M. Fullwinder Centennial Chair in Economic Freedom and is a director of the O'Neill Center for Global Markets and Freedom at Southern Methodist University at the Cox School of Business. He previously taught at Auburn University and Capital University, and he is the co-author of the widely cited Economic Freedom of the World annual uh, reports that, present, uh, an in, that presents an economic uh, freedom index for more than 150 countries over the course of decades. He also is a past president of the Association of Private Enterprise Education. He's a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute and a member of the Mont Pelerin Society. Please help me welcome Ben and Bob. Thank you very much, Ian and Cato, for hosting this. And uh, uh, I just learned that it was Milton Friedman's birthday before coming on, and it's uh, quite fitting, actually. The publisher's original blurb for the book said that socialism sucks as the bastard stepchild of Anthony Bourdain and Milton Friedman. And uh, that's exactly what we were going for that, of uh, good, solid economics, but communicated in a, a fun, entertaining way that will reach people who wouldn't otherwise read the usual academic stuff that Bob and I write. So, uh, the timing on it is obviously good with the, the popularity of socialism. We actually started the book over two years ago, and part of the motivation when the, the book's theme kind of took shape was the growing popularity of socialism in 2016. This is the uh, ever-prominent Michael Moore uh, tweeting out that young people like socialism uh, over capitalism, but confusing these things with fairness and selfishness. And what Bob and I wanted to do is write a book that actually explained what socialism is and is not, how it functions, and uh, to do it in an entertaining way. It's also the case that Bob wanted to get drunk in Cuba, and I wanted a way to write it off my taxes, so we decided we'd do that as the trial chapter. Uh, and in fact, uh, as I was thinking about it, uh, if the book does well, I'm pretty sure I should tell the IRS that I'm going to be researching a sequel for the next few years and writing off all of my bar tabs from now till then. Uh, <clears throat> so it's no surprise to anybody now that socialism is back and popular. Uh, a lot of the focus has been on young people and millennials who are attracted to it, but of course with the presidential debates you see it uh, among mainstream Democrats as well now. The New York Times had a, a year long, on the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, a year long column called Red Century. I think exactly one column in that year was dedicated to the economic stagnation of the system. A handful mentioned that atrocities, and almost always it was Stalin, I think once Mao. Instead, you got articles like why women had better sex under socialism, which, even if true, I don't know how we weight this against 100 million dead bodies. Uh, but this was the atmosphere that was taking hold as we were doing the book. It's obviously grown now. And we have confusion from politicians like Bernie Sanders, who says countries like Denmark, Sweden, and Norway are examples of socialism. They're not. I was going to insert a quote from AOC here, and uh, that was just a placeholder. Uh, then I decided it was better just to leave it like that. <laughs> so uh, the, the book, the tour that we go through, we start in Sweden, go to Venezuela, Cuba, Korea, China, Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, and then we end up back in the USSA uh, by attending the largest socialist gathering in the United States last summer. So let's start briefly with Sweden, and let's get the definition of socialism here correct. Socialism is some form of collective ownership or control over the major means of production. So this means abolishing private property and the major factors of production, replacing it with collective ownership. In practice, in any large society, this de facto means state ownership and or control of those means of production. Uh, if you're going to have large scale production, that then means that you're also going to have some form of central planning in order to do the coordination. Uh, so a lot of these young socialists like to say, oh, we want socialism from below, and everybody's just going to decide cooperatively what to do. Well, listen, your hippie commune's not going to produce an iPhone, comrade. Uh, you need somebody to coordinate the diverse areas of the economy, and when you don't use property rights that give you prices and profit and loss, that has to be replaced with something, that something is a central plan. I'll let Bob talk a little bit more about democratic socialism later. Uh, so first of all, Sweden and these other Nordic countries, they're not socialists. They're highly capitalist. They all, for the major factors of production, have private property. They have good contract enforcement, a tolerable degree of the rule of law, basically free trade, light regulation of businesses. Now, they have problems. Sweden's got a big welfare state and high taxes. 
Uh, this is true of the other Nordic countries as well. And these interventions in the free market have consequences, but they don't equal socialism. That's why when we go to social, excuse me, when we go to Sweden, the beer is great, the place is beautiful, it's not socialist. Uh, and Bob is the co-author of the Economic Freedom of the World Index. Uh, when we were writing this, Sweden was ranked 27th freest in the world, i.e. most capitalist, least socialist. Uh, and this is true of other Nordic countries as well. So, we can have great beer there. In fact, that's sitting in front of a, a, a Belgian beer bar. And the Belgian beers, even though Belgium's really close by, cost a ton of money, more than you're going to pay for them in Washington, D.C. And in fact, we drank some in South Korea on the other side of the world, and they were cheaper there than they are in Sweden. Um, and this big welfare state has dragged down Sweden's growth, and you know they are not as wealthy relative to the rest of the world as they used to be. But they're still a prosperous place, because they're mostly capitalist. Venezuela is the other end of the spectrum. So Venezuela is dead last in Bob's Economic Freedom Index. Uh, Cuba and North Korea are not ranked, but we could guess where they'd be. Uh, but Venezuela, it's important to remember, this is not a place that was always like that. The earliest year of the index in 1970, Venezuela is among, among the 10 most economically free countries in the world. What we saw is a long period of decline in economic freedom in Venezuela as they were moving away from capitalism into worse and worse forms of interventionism. So that they had stagnated, failed to grow. But back in 1970, when they were capitalists, they were also wealthy. In fact, they were wealthier per capita incomes than Spain itself. That's not true by 1998 when Chavez comes to power. Uh, but this was a capitalist, prosperous economy. And it's also, we don't have to go far, back very far to have people pointing to it as successful democratic socialism. Chavez, unlike the other ones, came to power in a democratic election that international observers widely said was fair. Uh, he began putting his socialist policies in place. And what was happening is Venezuela sits on the world's largest oil reserves. Uh, oil prices were high. As a result, his socialist policies were uh, uh, cutting out the core of the economy. Food production was plummeting in Venezuela, but they were using the revenues from oil to import food and other things for the population and give the big free handouts our politicians like to talk about from socialism. But once prices came down shortly after Chavez's death in 2013, and by the way, production also went down because the state-owned oil company, remember, state ownership and control of the means of production, doesn't give very good incentives for maintaining equipment and pipelines and such. So production, as well as prices, are down. They no longer have the foreign exchange to import the necessities. We have the crisis that we see today and that Bob and I saw when we were there in January of 2017. Uh, firsthand. In fact, the picture on the top left corner is uh, of the bridge that's been in the news recently where the aid trucks were all stopped from going in from Colombia. At the time we were there, people were free to move back and forth across them, and Venezuela by, Venezuelans by the thousands every day were coming across in, into uh, Colombia to buy basic necessities that were unavailable in the Venezuelan economy. And one striking thing that we saw in this too is it wasn't typical third world poverty. Bob and I have both been to a lot of poor countries. What you saw crossing the border is people who were middle class, upper middle class Venezuelans who still had some access to money that they could use to buy goods when they crossed the border. Uh, this is illustrating what a socialist economy does to those people who were previously prosperous in a capitalist society and seeing them struggling to make ends meet there on the border while we were there. Uh, I should also say, since we have this beer theme running throughout the book, Venezuela ran out of beer. If I were a socialist dictator, like toilet paper, beer, these are the things that like, we always have. Uh, by the way, that's not like an election speech. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but what actually happened is they have Polar, which is uh, a nominally privately owned company, but the government planning over the economy allocates foreign exchange, and they didn't allocate them enough foreign exchange to import the barley to make the beer. As a result, the country ran out of beer. So. Next, on our, oh, and I should just say about the democratic socialism with them, of course, this is what I think young democratic socialists often miss, is the necessary connection between a lack of economic freedom and a lack of political freedom. So once you abolish private property, you have to move towards planning and state control if you're gonna have any sort of advanced production. But that's also gonna be extremely inefficient and met with stagnation. People don't like that. That means they're gonna throw you out of power if they, they, you let them voluntarily reelect you. But precisely because you've centralized the power of the economy, you're able to repress them so that they can't th throw you out of office in a democratic election, which is exactly what we've seen with Maduro. He was reelected last year by wide margins, yet at the same time, people on average lost something like 24 pounds. They didn't all find Jenny Craig. 
when your population is literally not getting enough to eat, there's no way you get reelected. Instead, what did you have? You had state employees being ordered to reelect the person or they're gonna lose your job. They had food aid stands next to polling places. Um, so that is the necessary connection between uh, socializing your economy and democratic tyranny. Uh, Cuba is not starving socialism. This is subsistence socialism. It's kind of struggle, chugging along. And here I'll just give you a few anecdotes from the travel rather than a political economy story uh, that illustrates some of the dysfunction of a centrally planned system. So first, remember state ownership of means of production. Hotels are part of the means of production, so you have your state-owned hotel industry. So we weren't trying to, now you could stay at the Hotel National, that's their five-star diplomat hotel, which by all reports is nice. But other than that, the state-owned hotels suck. We stayed at one and we weren't trying to sandbag it. We, uh, this one was supposedly three stars and one of Bob's friends actually recommended the place. Uh, it's called the Hotel Trenton. It looks okay in its picture from when it opened in 1979. It looks a little less nice today, as you see the exterior. When we go to, go to our rooms, now remember, see how tall this building was? There's exactly four elevators and three of them are out of service. That's our bathroom ceiling. Um, this is another state hotel, uh, the Hotel Carib, I think, uh, in central Havana when we stayed at that one later. And uh, that's the glass that came out of the sanitary bag in the room with the stain on it. That's the soap that they kindly left us from the previous guest. That's the hole in the towel they gave to dry ourselves. That's the bolt missing from the toilet so that when you're on the seat, you can just slide right off. Now, same industry providing lodging. They've allowed limited private property rights and the ability for people to rent out their apartments for a profit. So they call them Casa Particulars. Now we prearranged one through Airbnb, which itself is a miracle because one, the internet's not widely available in Cuba and two, your credit cards don't work there. But enough of them have relatives in Miami that the people in Miami will put it up on Airbnb. You make the reservation through them, they take the money, they call their relative back in Cuba and tell them when you're coming. So this one's in central Havana. It was basically the same price as our god-awful hotel rooms. It's got a little kitchen, a dinette, two bedrooms that are nice, uh, and it's right downtown in central Havana. We stayed in another one for half that price, I think $25 a night in, in Trinidad. Uh, it was conveniently located directly above a bar, which was great, uh, and, and it had a porch too, so I could chain smoke my cigars. Basically, the Cuba trip was not fun, uh, at least from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., but after that, I basically drank and chain smoked cigars till 12 p.m., and or till 12 a.m., and that made everything all right, uh, sort of. Other oddity. So this is the power of property rights giving incentives. So no incentives under the hotels, incentives under the casas. What's missing from this picture? It's a commercial district in central Havana. Signs. Signs aren't missing because Cubans are poor. Signs are missing because no one gives a damn whether you come into their store or not. They don't make extra profits by bringing you in there. And if you do show up at the stores, what you're confronted with is an utter lack of variety. This is a well-stocked store, but you could probably count approximately maybe two dozen at most distinct items in that store. By the way, continuing with the beer metaphor, Cuba, they have beer, they didn't run out while we were there, but you got two types, Cristal and Bucanero. They're both roughly 5% alcohol, about a half percent difference between the two, and they both taste like a skunky Budweiser. That's your variety of Cuban beer. Uh, also, private restaurants. So they've allowed, so well, first of all, state ownership of means of production, there's widespread state ownership of restaurants, but they've been given limited freedoms to open private restaurants. They initially had restrictions on serving meat and seafood, those have been lifted. They had restrictions on how many people could be seated in them, but it's kind of widely ignored or worked around. Uh, and they're pretty good at first. And it's because they're trying, they've got the right incentives, but they're still in a socialist command economy and have to deal with that supply chain. So what you find is all of the private restaurants have the same about 12 to 18 items on the menu. They all taste basically the same, which is bland. Cuban food in Cuba sucks. Cuban food in Miami is delicious. A Cuban sandwich in Miami is a crappy ham and cheese sandwich in Cuba. Uh, and it's because of the ingredients that even when they have the right incentives, the supply chain, the economy isn't there to provide it. Uh, so instead, just pick a restaurant based on the venue of a, a rooftop or something like that because the food's gonna be the same. Uh, I'll, I'll end with, uh, on Cuba here, just an illustration because everybody knows about the 1950s American cars in Cuba. Uh, and then people think, well, it's because we have an embargo on Cuba that they're still stuck with American cars. Well, we have an embargo, not a blockade, although they like to call it that. There's no one stopping Kias from going to Cuba except Cuban government. And as a result, 
they have to keep using popsicle sticks and bubble gum to make their 1950s American cars tick. Uh, and as a result, in a country that's very poor, per capita income statistics are BS in socialist countries, but something on the order of $3,000-ish per, per capita income, you've got 1950s cars selling for $15,000, $16,000 when they're traded. The uh, Renault there in the, the picture, that's more like a $30,000 car. Uh, because it's a better suspension and brakes and it might even have AC. Uh, it doesn't exist in the United States. You don't even give this to your high school kid anymore. But if you stamp down supply hard enough, price, even when incomes are low, goes very high. So I'll stop with that and let Bob continue the tour with you. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about North Korea. And our wives uh, were very, very, generous in letting us travel all over these crazy places, but they did say we can't die or get arrested. Uh, so You're we didn't go, yeah, we, yeah, we've been prisoned. Okay. Yeah. We, so we didn't go into North Korea. Uh, we went to the border of North Korea and, and China, the Northern North Korea border, um, where there's just a river, the Alu River, which separates the, the two countries. And you've, many, many of you, actually I'll go forward one, you've, many of you have seen the, the satellite photo of, nor, of the Korean peninsula, the North, except for the capital, is essentially dark, and the south, of course, is these wonderful lights and filaments and of light going every direction. And then you see China on the northern side. China, of course, is developed quite nicely, but there's this dark section there of North Korea. And when we arrived um, in, in North Korea, it was dark, and we looked. We got to the river. We were very excited. Oh, there's North, we're going to see North Korea. It's right across the river. It's 100 yards away, and it's there's, it's just dark over there. There's like nothing over there. We were worried. We were worried. The guidebook said there's a city over there. We were worried that maybe we went to the wrong city because it, it, there didn't appear to be anything on the other side of the river. When we woke up in the morning, though, there is in fact a substantial city over there. Uh, so that satellite photo isn't photoshopped. It's actually real. You can literally stand uh, on the Chinese uh, side and look over into complete darkness. The Chinese side, meanwhile, uh, the city is called Dandong. It's not Shanghai or, or Beijing by any means, but it's a it's a substantial a modern, prosperous uh, Chinese city with skyscrapers and lights and advertising of all the modern, modern, uh, modern things. Uh, so, so that was uh, North Korea. And here you see the dark picture again. The upper, upper left over there is sort of North Korea. And then we wake up in the morning and you can see there's, oh, there's, there's actually a few hundred thousand people living on the North Korean side of that border, but at night they're, they're empty. The, as we went up and down the river and <laughs> At one point, I, I remember thinking, because there were Chinese patrol boats, Chinese Navy, po Coast Guard, uh, and I was, I was very happy to see them, which is a strange feeling, really, because I'm like, if our, if our boat, our little ferry that's on the river, if it breaks down and drifts to the North Korean side, I really would hope the Chinese Navy would come and get us before we got over to the wrong side of the border. But this is typical of what you would see. You'd see um, broken down homes, uh, anecdotally, and I still feel sorry. We, we went into some upriver, there's some farming areas, and everybody we saw working in the fields was with, it was like 19th century. They were using hand tools and, and, and animals to, to drag plows and things. There was one guy we saw in a field, and he had a, a, a diesel uh, tractor. It looked ancient, and it, you could hear, you know, that chug of a diesel, the, 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 you know, the chug that they make, an old diesel engine. And it was a little incline on the, on the farm field. And he was, and the, but he couldn't. He he just couldn't make it up. You could hear he was, and eventually, and I really felt sorry for the poor guy. Eventually, gave up, and the and the the tractor just sort of rolled backwards, and 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 so, very very sad situation. Again, meanwhile, you're looking on the Chinese side. If you look this direction, you're seeing highways with tractor trailer trucks whizzing by at 60 miles an hour. The contrast between the two, that you can see in North Korea, is really 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 stark. Again, there's the the Chinese side of the river and Ben in the, in the uh, river. Um, uh, we do talk in the book a lot about the, the tragedy that's gone on there. Uh, you know, the irony is if you go back to the uh, end of the Korean War, now the Korean War did create massive uh, damage to the, to the entire country, but uh, if anything, the northern side was the prosperous. The northern side was the industrial prosperous part of the peninsula. The south was the sort of backward farmers. And of course, it's reversed today. And, and we, we cite some statistics about the the incomes. Ben is right. Income statistics in socialist countries uh, are really almost meaningless in a lot of ways, but uh, the best estimates we have are the income in North today is maybe a couple thousand dollars per person. That's probably generous. Uh, North Korean, of course, South Korea is now uh, one of the richest countries in the world. 
So, uh, segueing over to the, to the China side, we, we hit uh, Beijing and, 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 and Shanghai, and the title of this chapter is called Fake Socialism. Uh, immediately upon landing, you realize when you see signs for the Gap and Gucci and all the Western brands and so forth, this is not socialist country. These are private firms. They're making profits. The people are busy. The beer is good again. Um, and so it's, it's a fake socialism. We talk about that. We do take the time to talk about the, um, the history of Chinese socialism. Um, and it is, in fact, uh, a, a sort of a schizophrenic place. Uh, um, today, they're trying to have economic freedom for large portions of their country. And as a result of that economic freedom, China has developed quite rapidly, and people have gotten quite prosperous in, in general, um, at least compared to the old days. Uh, but it's also still trying to be a, a, a totalitarian political regime, as we've all seen. And Ben and I attended a conference. Uh, it was a really weird thing. We, what we were talking about Ayn Rand and Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian economist, Nobel Prize winner, in Beijing, which was, like, can you imagine, how cool is this? We're talking about Ayn Rand and Hayek in, in Beijing at a conference, and it was filled with, with locals, Chinese uh, academics and journalists. And to, but to remind us all that the, the Chinese Communist Party is still in charge, the very next day, the very morning, next morning, thugs showed up from the government and padlocked the doors with chains, and, and the conference was, was called off. So, so China is trying to do this dance now where they are giving away the freedom to engage in commerce and, and better your condition and, and prosper and have profits, uh, but also they're, they're trying to control their, their, their thoughts and their minds and their political freedoms. And, um, I, we suspect this is not a sustainable path, but there you go. Uh, quickly, I mentioned Russia, Ukraine, the chapter there. That's us standing in line at the, standing in line, of course, was a popular thing to do in the old Soviet Union. Well, guess what? You still have to stand in line if you're going to see Lenin because they don't charge for Lenin's tomb. So when prices are too low, as they are in socialist countries, sometimes you get lines. Sure enough, you get a line there. And there's still some Soviet art, but it's, we call this hungover socialism because it's not socialism anymore. There's no central plan. There's no uh, private property has been reestablished for the most part, uh, but it's hung over. They're still suffering the after effects. They haven't really moved the uh, China, or excuse me, Russia and Ukraine really haven't moved to towards economic freedom. But the country that has, the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, um, uh, is really now a capitalist country. In the economic freedom of the world index that I write, Georgia is now uh, in the top 10 highest ranked countries in the world. This is me flipping the bird to, of Stalin and his hometown of Gori. Uh, drinking some wine. Uh, uh, just in terms of the alcohol theme, Georgia is a great wine country. And in Soviet times, they made lots of really bad wine. The central planters plowed under major, massive amounts of, of acreage. They planted French grapes. They made French style wines, Cabernets and such. And it's just terrible. But the entire Soviet world was, was supplied from Georgia with, with wine. Uh, today, all those fields have gone to foul. It's terrible. They, they've just let them go to seed. But the Georgians are, are bringing back their own local grapes, their own local varietals, and their own old-fashioned, non-French style of making wine. It's a different style of making the wine. And so if you're a wine snob, uh, Georgia is becoming a, a mecca, a worldwide mecca for people who want to enjoy uh, unique uh, wines that just don't literally don't exist in the rest of the world. Uh, Georgia's success since the, the, their, what they call the Rose Revolution, uh, we talk about that. Uh, in terms of the, the signaling of the new country, the new, new way of doing things in Georgia, that's a police station. Uh, police stations are always made in, out of glass now in Georgia to signal their transparency, which I, I, that's, we don't really literally mean transparency when we say that word usually, but uh, the Georgians took that literally. Um, and then last, I'll talk about the, the Chicago uh, conference. Uh, we went to the Socialism Conference in Chicago. It bills itself as the largest gathering of American socialists. When we arrived, Ben and I stood out, not because we were wearing blue blazers, but we stood out because we were middle-aged. Tell them what you wore, Bob. I wore my Cincinnati Reds hat. I thought that would be funny, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, come on. They, they, no one caught the joke. I was really angry that no one thought that was funny. Um, and so, um, and you know, we, we found a lot of confusion. The same confusion that Ben talked about with Bernie, we found here. We talked to a lot of kids who were just sort of leftist kids who, had, who saw the world. They saw injustice in the world in various ways. And they wanted to do something about it. And somehow or another, they thought socialism was that thing. And, and we would even ask them, so you think we should get rid of private property? And some of them said, yeah. And other ones like, no, why would we do that? Like, well, that's what socialism means. It means getting rid of private property. So we kids at a socialism conference calling each other comrade were unclear on what the definition of socialism actually was. Um, 
the, 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 at the end, I'll close on talking about the beer theme. Uh, beer became, again, a running metaphor for us to talk about. Kind of, we're back in the USA, a capitalist country. There's a brewery in Illinois called Revolution Brewery. Their, their bar tap is a raised fist with a red star on it. And all of the labels for their beers, they have a couple dozen varieties of wonderful craft beers. Um, uh, they're all commie-themed uh, sort, of, sort of marketing. Um, but they're really the irony uh, is that uh, we're sitting here in Chicago drinking Revolution Brewery. And that, co that company, which is a private for-profit company, uh, makes a greater variety and a better quality of beer than all the socialist countries in the world combined. Um, and we thought that was an ironic thing. The kids who were just drinking it thought, this is just, oh, look great, Stalin's on a label. OK. Yeah. Um, just to close up, the book has done pretty well. We are number one new release in the category beer. <laughs> How about that? Uh, so. Uh, uh, so there you go. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, now we'll hear from Matt Kibbe, who is the president and chief community organizer at Free the People, which is an, organiza an educational organization uh, turning the next generation on to the values of liberty. He is an executive producer at Blaze TV, where he produces the Kibbe on Liberty podcast, as well as Deadly Isms, a documentary series about the dangers of all flavors of authoritarianism. In 2004, uh, Matt Kibbe founded Freedom Works, where he served as president for 11 years. He is uh, the author of various books, most recently, uh, New York Times bestseller, Don't Hurt People and Don't Take Their Stuff. Matt, uh, at the end of the, of the book, there's a discussion with Matt about um, what, how to interpret the, the appeal of socialism in the United States. And Matt uh, was very involved with the Tea, tea Party movement. Uh, and so he's always had his finger on the pulse of uh, political sentiments in this country. And uh, that's what he discusses at the end of the book. And he can help us understand what is going on in this country. It's great to be here, and uh, I should start by pointing out that uh, these two economists, you know, they're, they're not just ivory tower guys. If you try to slog through some of their academic works, you might think so. But a serious amount of hands-on empirical work was done, and I'm counting this empirical work in the number of beers and the number of hangovers. Uh, we, we actually did a podcast about a month ago, uh, my podcast, Kibbe on Liberty, where we did an empirical comparison of American craft beers. And we had a North Korean beer, which you smuggled back illegally. We had some uh, Polar, Cerveza Polar from, from Venezuela, which not ironically is, is made in Florida because they can't actually produce it in Venezuela anymore. And the North Korean beer, you'll be shocked to know, was, was so undrinkable that even Ben poured it out. <laughs> that does not happen. <laughs> and you got to ask yourself, with all this empirical evidence about socialism failing and all of the, the slideshow you just saw, it seems, it seems pretty stark. It seems pretty visceral. It seems pretty obvious that socialism doesn't work in practice. We have a, we have a history of the last 100 years of, of really horrible experiments. Pol Pot managed to kill one in four Cambodians in less than four years. How do you do that? You have to try really hard. And you have to have an ideology that is so dysfunctional as to shut down any sort of conceivable market. And yet, when, when I post these videos, when you guys post these videos, um, someone from uh, Socialists of America will say, that's not socialism. That's oligarchy. That's state capitalism. That's fill in the blank. There's all sorts of sort of workarounds as to why it was that Mao wasn't really a socialist or Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro, they're not socialists. They're doing something else. And you get so frustrated. So because it seems like logic, economics, empirical evidence, none of these things seem to hold sway as young people, as you pointed out in the beginning of your talk, are, are now sort of conflicted. It, it runs about 50-50, depending on the scare poll that you look at, that young people are saying, you know what, socialism, I, I want that more than capitalism. So what are we to do with this? Um, I recently reread, as I am wont to do, an old essay by Frederick Hayek. Because when I don't know what to do, I always ask myself, well, what, what would Hayek do? 
what would Hayek do? And it turns out that he wrote an essay in 1949. He's literally communist to the left and fascist to the right. He's thinking that the darkest days of, of liberalism and free markets are here and that we're never going to recover. And he's trying to figure out how, what to do about the rise of socialist sentiments. It's called The Intellectuals and in Socialism. Please read it. It's a short read. It'll, it'll give you a sense that possibly with a few exceptions. It was written yesterday because he's dealing with all the same stuff that we're dealing with today. And there's a couple points that he makes that, that I want to tease out. The first is, and, and Ben's uh, batshit crazy quote <laughs> aside, he says to take your intellectual opponents seriously. And all of us have participated in sharing memes on Facebook where we, we love to make fun of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or some other socialist, democratic socialist, saying things that, that we know are obviously not true. But Hayek would say, take them seriously. He would also say in that same essay, and I feel like he's talking about Mitch McConnell here, that just because you're criticizing socialism doesn't mean that you have any idea what a cogent critique of socialism actually is. Mitch McConnell famously a couple weeks ago declared himself the grim reaper of any legislation proposed by Democrats that was socialist. I'm not sure that's good messaging. I think if I'm 20 years old and I'm trying to decide between Mitch McConnell, the Grim Reaper, or AOC, the happy warrior for democratic socialism, who are you gonna choose? Who am I gonna choose? We should think about that and we should take Hayek seriously. But I happen to believe that, that young people, as was alluded to, <coughs> if you ask them whether or not they believe that the government should own the means of production, and Reason did a poll about this a couple years ago, uh, the answer almost categorically is hell no. That's a stupid idea. So they're talking about something else. When they, when they put that qualifier, democratic socialism, socialism that, that seems to suggest in the narrative of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a belief in community, a belief in people at the local level working together to solve problems and respecting each other. And somehow that bottom-up process is a way that we can solve all of the problems. You go, watch, go back and watch her original viral video that got her elected to Congress. You will find yourself agreeing with her probably all the way up until the last minute of that video. 90% through, you're nodding your head yes, because she's railing against crony capitalism. She's railing against insiders in Washington, D.C., who don't give a damn about her folks back home. She's railing about incumbents for life. She's talking about that sense of community, and she uses the word dignity a lot. Community, dignity, bottom-up, peaceful cooperation, these are not socialist concepts. That's us. That's what we believe. Which leads me to my third point, and the most important in this Hayek essay. Hayek says that the reason that socialists in 1949 have had so much sway with intellectuals and with popular opinion is that they were able to craft a vision that imagined a utopian future that was better than the status quo, something big, something beautiful, a promise that just around the corner, we could do something better together than we've ever done before. And the critics, and I'll go back, I, I, I feel like, Cato, I can pick on Mitch McConnell, right? Is that okay? Anyone gonna protest? Um, Mitch McConnell, when he criticizes socialism, he is doing what Hayek warns against. It sounds like he's just defending the status quo. All the Wall Street bailouts, all the permanent wars, whatever it is that you see in Washington that you find so repugnant, the critics of socialism here in Washington, D.C. generally identify as what they're against. They're against AOC. But what are they for? Are they actually for free markets? Are they actually for that peaceful bottom-up cooperation? I'm not sure that they are, but all of us, if we want to win the next generation, we have to imagine something utopian, something beautiful, something bigger and better than we've seen in the past. Which brings me to beer. <laughs> Look at that. That's an IPA, Snake Dog IPA, from our friends at Flying Dog Brewing, Jim Caruso, 
a fellow libertarian. He actually applies his libertarian principles to his production of beer. But if you go to any grocery store, almost anywhere in America, and you go to the, the beer section, that, that beautiful cooler, it is a shrine to free market capitalism. It is a holy place. Things get a little bit quieter there as you try to figure out which double dry hop triple IPA you are going to choose there. You can't do that in Venezuela. Ben suggested this, like you can't get even crappy warm beer in Venezuela. So maybe there's something about that. Anybody here that's into craft beer, if you go to your local producer, I'm sure this is true at the brewery that you reference, um, it's a beautiful place. Started by entrepreneurs, people that are thinking about entrepreneurship in the way that Mises thought about it when he said that entrepreneurship is imagining an alternative future even as people laugh at you. And if you know anything about the craft beer industry, those triple hop, double IPAs, um, most people sort of make fun of that stuff. The rest of us are waiting in line for six hours to buy a four pack. That's the beauty of creating something that's never been done before. And they come together in cooperation and they hang out and they have a sense of belonging and community. And it's all driven by that entrepreneur and his right in a free market capitalist society to create something and to share it with his neighbors. Maybe that's the metaphor. Maybe beer is exactly what we're trying to talk about. You know, we always use downward sloping demand curves. And, uh, you know, if you're a real libertarian like me and you're hanging out with your friend, you start arguing about the non-aggression principle and things that normal people have no idea what we're talking about. But if you don't understand the beer metaphor, there's probably something wrong with you. You probably are not going to be helped by anything we have to say, so we're gonna write you guys off. But the rest of the world, particularly young people, young people that are flirting with the idea of, of democratic socialism, let's connect with them with those stories. And I have to say, as a final thought, um, the final chapter where you go talk to the young socialists um, in the United States, it would be easy to make fun of them. It would be easy to troll them. It would be easy to take a picture of the most ridiculous person and post it on Instagram and say, what, these guys are silly. But that's not what you did. You were empathetic, you were listening, you were trying to understand where they were coming from. If we do that and we explain the beauty of liberty and freedom, I think this generation, the generation flirting with democratic socialism will prove to be the most libertarian ever. Thank you. Thanks very much, Matt. We have time for questions. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and when you're called on, wait for the microphone, identify yourself and your affiliation, and make a, a brief uh, question. So, do we have questions? Uh, we'll take a question uh, right here in the front. We need microphones, please. There, we'll take... This gentleman in the white uh, shirt here in the second row. Uh, thank you. My name's Dave Rubinowitz, I'm retired. And it seems to me in most cases when there are really strong disagreements, it's a question of semantics. People are using the same word with totally different definitions. So you're using the classic Marxist definition of socialism and if you look at the young socialists, they're using a totally different definition. They're basically thinking, in capitalism, everything's owned by somebody. You step off your property, you're on someone else's property, they can control whatever it is. And as soon as you have commons, you have public streets, you have parks, stuff like that, that's socialism. My question is, who gets to define the term? Is it Karl Marx, is it Bernie Sanders, is it Wikipedia? Who defines what socialism is? Well, I think, it, I mean, language is a spontaneous order, right? And so the, it's incumbent upon us to be clear about what we're meaning when we use our words and make sure we communicate effectively with them. I think the young socialist and, you know, what Bob said, many of them just don't identify it with abolishing private property. I think a lot of them think in aspirations and goals rather than means of achieving them. So like in the last chapter in the book, one of the things we do while we're at this socialist conference, we heard talks on immigration, anti-war, anti-imperialism, uh, Black Lives Matter and police brutality, a whole bunch of things where 
we're like, yeah, we basically agree with you. This is a problem in the United States, so we need to do better. We need to be you know, more pro-immigration. We need to be more anti-war. We need to roll back the police in the United States. And it's just the kids were then saying, and the answer is socialism. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. The answer is like freedom and the voluntary system, what, what Matt's referring to. Yeah, if, you know, we use the term socialism. Socialism sucks. It's the title of the book. And, uh, but, you know, in the book, we, we, we take pains to define our terms. We define it in the classical way. But we also, you know, it, it, there's no black and white. It's not a zero one world out there. There's socialism in the United States. You know, we have public schools. That's pub, the government is literally owning and centrally planning the education system for most of the country. Uh, but, and that's where the economic freedom index that I, I work on comes in. It's really a continuum from on the one end of the spectrum, more socialism. That's the Sweden or the, the Venezuelas of the world and the Cubas. And then on the other end of the spectrum, it's the more, more capitalist countries. It's not a zero one. There's no bright line between, you know, when you stop being capitalism and start being socialist. Uh, Adam, what's the saying from Adam Smith? There's a lot of ruin in, in every nation. Well, there's a lot of socialism in every nation. And uh, so we do, in the book, we use the index, uh, and it's really the shades of gray that, the, that something like an index can give us that I think really helps, helps move the conversation. Having said that, uh, since socialism is the buzzword of the day, uh, we've, we felt it was important to make that, you know, uh, the focal point for the book. Yeah, and by the way, this is why, why listening is so important, because these buzzwords like capitalism and socialism, I generally don't even like to use the words because they have so much, so much baggage that you may be talking to someone and they may not be hearing what you're trying to say. I, I like to focus on, on sort of simple human values-based language because I think that's where there's a lot of connection with, with young people, even though when it came to those two words, we might find ourselves on opposite sides. Yes, a question uh, in that row, the gentleman in the blue shirt, please. Thank you, I'm Leon Weinschauber. I'm a retired member of the Foreign Service. I wonder if you can help us understand what should we think of when we hear a candidate like Bernie Sanders saying he's for democratic socialism. Help me understand what, what does he mean, if you know what that means, and what, what should we think of when people say, I want a social welfare state? So I, I think that when you hear Bernie and others say this, that they don't mean real socialism as in the way Bob and I define the term of the government owning most of the means of production. However, Bernie and AOC and the rest of them do want to march you down that road to serfdom farther in that direction. And that's the shades of gray that Bob's talking about in the index uh, of, you know, whether it's moving to... Medicare for all or socializing the healthcare industry and talk, well, that's one more means of production that's being moved over there. It doesn't mean the government's going to own Walmart. Uh, but uh, if you listen to Elizabeth Warren, she wants uh, government or somebody else outside on the boards of directors of these private companies. So I think thinking about the continuum is really about what the, the debate is from the candidates. There's nobody who's going to nationalize the means of production if they're elected. Uh, question here in the front. My name is Liz Kim. I'm a reporter with Voice of America's Korean uh, service, and so I have to ask you about North Korea. Um, you, s you said North Korea, right after the Korean War, economically superior to South Korea. So do you think the socialism was the reason behind that? And the second question is, I understand that North Korea is right now twigging its options to imitate China's or Vietnam's growth uh, path. Do you think it's a viable option for them? Um, so, I mean, uh, after, I mean, during, I mean, the Chinese peninsula was, I mean, was occupied by Japan for many, many years, and uh, the Korean peninsula was, uh, was, was run by the Chinese, and so it was sort of a dictatorship, but it was mostly a private, private property kind of system. Uh, so what was, the reality was, most of the electricity, most of the heavy industry that, that existed in Korea was on the northern side, and uh, it wasn't a result of socialism, it was just a result of the sort of the conditions that were were present there, uh, but um, I would applaud uh, North Korea moving in the Chinese direction. I mean, just because uh, uh, you, you can't have all the freedom in the world doesn't mean some freedom is gonna, not going to help. Um, millions, hundreds of millions of Chinese people are living dignified, comfortable, material existences because the Chinese government now lets them engage in trade and markets, and that should be 
something we applaud. Now, the fact that China hasn't gone as far down the road to freedom as we would like is, is regrettable, but uh, I, would, I think that that would be great for the Koreans. I mean, right now they're, they're on the edge of starvation. So moving towards a, a opening up markets of the, of the type that has happened in, in China or Vietnam is absolutely a great idea for, for North Korea, and I hope they do it. I hope they move all the way to freedom. <laughs> but if they can't move all the way, at least move a little way. Yeah, I'll follow up on that too. So one, to just very clearly answer the first part of your question. Yes, this is like the, the global example of one place, one people, one language, one history, one culture, and you change one factor, your economic system. You get socialism in one, you get capitalism in the other. That's a natural experiment. And it shows side by side what capitalism or what freedom really will do for people versus state control. Uh, the second thing in terms, I agree with Bob entirely, moving in the Chinese and Vietnamese direction of reform would boost incomes and make people better off there. One caveat, and I want to just draw this out about China for people. In China, you have vast differences in the economic freedom across regions of China, particularly coastal cities and enterprise zones who have even more economic freedoms. But here's what's interesting. Within China, de facto now, de facto now you basically have freedom of movement. So you have Billion, over a billion people and free migration with income differences and freedom differences between rural interior provinces and coastal cities that are not unlike differences between Latin America and the United States today, where you see immigrants who want to move to get the productivity of the place rather than the productivity of the people. And that type of big growth, a lot of China's growth has been fueled by internal migration of going to freer places. Something on North Korea's scale is unlikely to get that part of the dynamic. They could still, like Bob says, move in that direction. Um, but I think it's important actually also for our, our outreach with the book on this to point out that, you know, freedom of movement, free trade and labor is part of the, the free market system too. The internal migration in China is probably the largest mass migration in our times and by far. Question in the back, please, there in the, in the corner. Hi, uh, <clears throat> Lod Vida with the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. So regarding the rising popularity of socialism, how much of that do you think is like a result of short-term anger on the left against Trump, like the ballooning of the DSA membership, and how much of it do you think is a longer-term trend that's here to stay? Thank you. Um, uh, I'll start and I'll, I'll say first that the fact that um, socialism is clearly going to be a defining campaign issue going into 2020. May not necessarily be a good thing for those of us who would love for people to fully understand the difference between uh, however you define Trumpism versus um, what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, and seemingly all, almost all of the, the Democratic uh, uh, candidates for president seem to be espousing. So part of it is partisan. And, and part of the opposition to it is also partisan. But I also think, uh, going back to an earlier question, there, there's a similarity in a lot of ways between the, the attraction of, of a candidate like Ron Paul, an outsider, a, a iconoclast, uh, someone that was raging against the machine, someone that was taking on the Republican establishment, and Bernie Sanders a couple years later. He was, he was attracting that same cohort of, of young people. And I don't think it had a lot to do with ideology. I think it was an ethos. I think it was a sense that that guy's authentic. That guy, he's, he's angry about the same things I am, the Wall Street bailouts and the permanent wars and, and mass incarceration. Um, I just described both of those candidates. Um, of course, they have very different policy conclusions. I, I, I don't think this is about a shift in ideology. I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a cultural um, those guys seem cooler. And again, I'll say it again, just to pick on Mitch McConnell one last time, on the cool factor, AOC, Mitch McConnell, you do the math. Here in the second row. Uh, my name. Well, 
owns you under socialism. I mean, you don't own yourself. Government owns you. It's a nationalization not only of means of production, but it's nationalization of people. And people do not have choices. And who does not have choice? Slaves do not have choice. And what do you think about, about that, 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 that socialism is just another form of public slavery? And that's why they were disposing millions of people the way they did, because the people were not only an asset, but they were also a liability. Yeah, thank you, Yuri. Uh, I, I agree completely. You are a part of the means of production, which means now the people are a means, not an end. And I think there's a, it's a, a, a huge waste and problem for any ideology that puts people as the means instead of the ultimate ends. Okay, we'll take a question uh, in the third row there, gentleman in the white shirt. Is that we'll take one question, please, and identify yourself, please. Uh, you mentioned. Uh, Could you please identify yourself? Uh, I'm just a uh, participant. Okay. <laughs> uh, when you said 100 million dead bodies, are you talking also about those who have been killed, men destroyed by USA, CIA, and Western? countries all over the world, in Vietnam, in Middle East, in Africa, and all over. And why don't you just, why do you close your eyes with what the capital is, not uh, in the sense of equal opportunity, but, but the sense of uh, what they really are doing all over the world. This, uh, why the, uh, Venezuela has come to this uh, situation is because of the, isn't it because of the, uh, what the U.S. is doing to him or the Western country or including uh, uh, Cuba, including Iran, including South okay. North Korea. Isn't that Thank you. because of that uh, reason? All right, so first, this book's on socialism sucks. I would love to be, have it be successful enough for the sequel to be fascism sucks. Two economists travel their way through the fascist world. Uh, but I sympathize with you and agree, but I would not call say that capitalism has killed all of these people that you're mentioning. Capitalism is voluntary interaction among consenting adults. What you've described as imperialism of various sorts of states, which both Bob and I, I think, are fully on board with you and would oppose. And if, if I could just add, I, I can't remember the author. There's a book called Democide. And R.J. Rummel. Thank you. And uh, the, the number, the 100 million that we, we generally use, doesn't involve war. And if you add war into that, you get a much bigger number. And of course, all sorts of ideologies that, that centralize government power have killed all sorts of people in war. And we, we, we're not generally supportive of, of authoritarians killing people. You and uh, everybody else in this room are invited to our many forums here at the Cato Institute where we have scholars criticizing uh, U.S. adventurism abroad, which has nothing to do with the free market model. Next question. Gentleman over there, please. Thanks. Uh, Mitch Beagle, private participant. I'm just curious, you didn't mention the kibbutzes in Israel. Is that just Could like you speak up just a little bit, please? Could you speak up just a little bit, please? You didn't mention the kibbutzes in Israel. Is that just an aberration in your thought process as a successful socialist enclave? Yeah, I'd be happy to take that. The, you know, uh, private... Uh, socialist experiments uh, on a small scale um, have had some limited success, and probably the Israeli kibbutz have been the most successful, um, although they haven't been greatly successful. One of the things that Ben mentioned, though, that I think is critical is large-scale production, an iPhone. Um, that kind of scale of operation is very difficult to imagine in this sort of socialism from below model where you've got sort of a network of small worker-run democratically, worker democracy kind of enterprises. In fact, the Israeli kibbutz, although they have had some staying power, have mostly been economic failures. Most of them have closed. Most of them have sort of evolved into sort of homeowners associations, really. So uh, the empirical reality is 
um, that that kind of operation is uh, not been all that successful, I think, for good economic reasons. But, you know, the wonderful thing about capitalism, proper capitalism, is we invite people to, to I mean, it invites, it invites anyone to make whatever managerial style for an operation you want. Um, uh, you know, so is kibbutzes, communes, worker-run cooperatives, all of these types of things are perfectly legal and allowed in a ca within a capitalist system. And I applaud these experiments. And if they are successful, if they are truly superior, um, so, so much the better. I don't think they're actually frequently very much superior, but, th but that's an empirical question. Yeah, so just, just related to that too, I mean, neither Bob nor I run our family like a market economy. My kid doesn't bargain for, you know, we run it along something along the lines of from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. But that, that family, right, is an island uh, of socialism interacting in a world of capitalism with everywhere else. And that's what makes it function. And as soon as you scale up from that very small family, to the kibbutz or something like that, you start getting these bad incentive problems first. And then as you try to scale up bigger to the society, that's where your information problems completely break down. But I'll mention one of these uh, kibbutz-like experiments in our own history that's worth thinking back to is Plymouth Plantation and the Pilgrims. When uh, they originally came here, they had communal property rights. Everybody was supposed to work and produce in the fields together. It went to a central warehouse. It was distributed by need. And here you've got a, a religiously and culturally homogeneous group of people who've gone to a new world. They're like a big family in it together. And it's not really advanced material production. It's very basic production they have to do. And they starve for years and years. Then, you know, the nice Thanksgiving story of they planted corn, they, they, they're taught how to do that and how to feast. While true, that wasn't the end of their starving, they continued to starve for two more winters until uh, William Bradford's, uh, of, I think, uh, on Plymouth Plantation, or of Plymouth Plantation is the history that he wrote of it in 1647. And then he describes, we created private property, and all of a sudden, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't do old English, but basically, all the idle hands became industrialists. Women and children went to the fields who used to never do it before. And that's just the incentive problem on that small scale like that. Yeah, I think we can all, to anybody who has a family can identify with that problem. You, you know how much money my kids owe me? Uh, we got a question way in the back, please. A lot, a lot of money. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Rick Leeds. I've got a blog, 53% government cost crisis. Um, the two-party system is based on single round voting. Um, how much, well, if the Republicans don't make the free market argument um, convincing enough, then for a lot of people, there's just one alternative. So how much do you think that the two-party system is responsible for this situation? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I, I, think, I think you're in this, 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 this awesomely democratized and decentralized process that we're going through right now. Where, where everything is shifting back to the end user. And the one, the one place that isn't happening is in politics. We still have two parties. And uh, on a lot of days, from a libertarian perspective, it's kind of, kind of hard to tell the difference um, if you look at things that we used to care about, like, like spending and, and executive authority and, and, and war and those kinds of things. But, but I think the, this whole idea that that there's a left versus right, there's a red pill and a blue pill. Um, I think I think it's simplistic and wrong. I, I don't think that's what it's all about at all. I think I think the the real measure is is authoritarianism on the bottom of the scale, upwards towards this thing I was talking about earlier, where we where we get to cooperation and dignity and liberty and and all the beautiful things that happen when we when we work together. Um, so you know, is is there a difference between Pol Pot? Who was a nationalist, and Adolf Hitler, who was also a socialist. I don't, I don't think so in practice, and I, I reject that sort of left-right thing. Um, we we got to get out, out, outside of politics if we want to connect with people. Once we join our political team, the other side that we're trying to convince stops listening. Um, but if we focus on values and and things that that we share and agree upon, that's that's how we connect. If it if it comes down to a political fight. Um, I think everybody loses. Question in the back uh, there in the aisle, please.
Robert Anthony Peters, filmmaker with TankmanTheMovie.com. Uh, just wondering if there's anything you guys found that socialism does better, whether it's product or services. Propaganda? No. <laughs> so I'm thinking about not giving a non-snarky answer. I'm doing my best here. But I also, when we were interviewing people, I remember we were uh, interviewing a man from Belarus. And, uh, this was, I think, in the Ukraine when we were interviewing him. And I asked him, like, well, come on. I, listen, I know you're a free market guy, but I'm like, uh, you got to pick something. If you think back prior to 1991, I'm like, what, what one thing was better for you? And he pauses, nothing. Nothing was better for me. The Russian army sent me to Siberia. <laughs> and uh, that was the answer he gave me. So that's all I'll give you. <laughs> you know, I... I, I Misery loves company is a saying for a reason. And just like older Americans, like my, my grandparents' generation, uh, they they actually sometimes look wistfully back to the Great Depression. You know, you know the Great Depression was was a terrible time, but we were all in it together. We all sort of suffered collectively, and there's a certain nostalgia almost for that. Uh, so, I mean, if there's <laughs> this is a backward compliment. If socialism does one thing well, it sort of throws everybody into this sort of horrible existence, but there is a certain camaraderie that, that I think that might engender among the, the people who are suffering under it. That's about as good as I'm going to get, Robert. I'm sorry. By, by the way, there's, there's winners and losers under socialism, and I think that uh, Hugo Chavez's daughter and Nicolas Maduro's son, they love socialism. It's awesome for them. It's a very lucrative situation. You, you know, to follow up on Bob's comment on this too, Robert, the economist Dan Klein has done some work years ago on what he calls the people's romance. And it's people wanting to have a collective experience of us doing it together. And he uh, comments that people that are more individualist and libertarian have a harder time making the non-aggression axiom or something, the, the collective experience. Uh, which, by the way, is, I think, important why we have uh, substitute collective experience for, uh, for politics which means things like professional sports where we're all in it together. I'm much happier to be a, a member of Red Sox nation than some political identity. Uh, it also works out better that my sports nations are better than Bob's. This is true. Actually, in, in the 10 seconds while Ben was blathering on, I came up with a better answer. Uh, so uh, when we were in Cuba, one of the things you find about Cuba is the liveliness of the, of the locals. The, the, mus the music is is wonderful. Every restaurant and bar you go to, and especially you get out of the tourist area, you go into central Havana, uh, wonderful music and people singing and dancing and, and, you know, but, but the plumbing is all falling apart and the buildings are crumbling, but you know, this is actually a, a hallmark of socials and they've, they've leveled wages so much. I mean, basically you make the same if you're a plumber as if you're a musician. So do the math, folks. I mean, who wants to be a plumber? That's a terrible, dirty job. So everyone decides to be musicians. So you get you get oversupply, and we ran into every, it's like almost everybody you meet who's from Soviet times in Georgia or Ukraine. Like everybody, like, what did you study in college? Physics, uh, because people with any integrity would would try to avoid political science or economics. They said, well, "I'll study," because math doesn't have many ideological overtones. So they 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 massively overproduce physicists and mathematicians and chess players and gymnasts while they were massively underproducing uh, plumbers, <laughs> you know, people that can you know, fix brick that's falling down and things like that. So you get these weird imbalances. But in those areas that are being oversupplied, you can say, oh, wow, look at all the great art. Look at all the great music. Any other questions? Right there. Hello, my name is Grayson McSwain. Uh, I'm an intern at Chartwell Strategy Group. And recently, the Ukrainian uh, parliament uh, had an election where Serpent of the People, President Zelensky's party, uh, won a majority. Uh, they're self-described as libertarian, and also they are largely reformist. Uh, my question is, if they are to actually implement reforms for the Ukrainian economy, they would have to delve into real complex issues such as pensions, uh, privatization of land, companies, and these could prove very unpopular among Ukraine. So for these hungover uh, socialist countries that you talked about earlier, how would you recommend that they start implementing reforms that, so that they can implement them and actually sustain the reforms? 
I, I think you need to do what Georgia did. Georgia was in exactly the same situation in 2004 when they had their Rose Revolution. Uh, in fact, in, in many ways, Georgia's situation was bleaker than what currently exists in Ukraine. Um, and they elected a, a, a libertarian uh, leader, Shakasvili and Kaha Bendikidze. And they, um, they quickly handled all these issues. But the, 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 I think the thing, though, is quick. You don't get time uh, to dilly-dally around because there is going to be opposition. They handled, uh, I mean, give you just a couple examples. Um, police corruption was, was one of the worst, worst problems in Georgia. Um, they fired 35,000 police officers in a day. Now, this is a country of about 4 million people. So this would be the equivalent of firing every cop in, in, in Washington, D.C., just like tomorrow there are no police officers. Um, and, of course, crime went down when you fired the cops because the cops were the criminals. And in a span of about 12 to 18, 18 months, about a year and a half, they tackled pensions. They tackled the incredibly Byzantine tax system. They, they got rid of all their tariffs. They, they did a laundry list of sort of libertarian laundry list of, of, of things. And the opposition almost didn't have a, ch a chance to, to gather itself. And eventually they did. And, and those reforms slowed down and eventually stalled. But um, they, they have stuck. It's now, we're, we're 10 years out now. Well, more than 10 years out. And the Georgian, the new government, which is not a libertarian government by any means in Georgia, uh, they have not undone those, those libertarian uh, reforms in Georgia. So my, 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 my advice is look at Georgia as a great example of how it can be done. Uh, but doing it quick, having a, a, a real leader who's willing to take the take those hits, though, because people criticize from day one, but uh, the government, you know, stuck with it. We have time for one or two more questions. We'll take a question here. Thank you very much. My name is Todd Wiggins. Uh, my website's called Meet Me DC. I have a quick question about the happiness quotient. It's an abstract um, idea, but that you can actually be happier in a less developed society than you can be in some cases in a more developed society. Did you see that facet? And I think you did allude to it when you talked about music and art and so on, some of the things that you saw in Cuba that you felt were ideal. So I'll try with that, and I'll, I'll give you two different answers. The first part is, I completely agree with you. Some people can be happier in a less developed society to a degree. But we also have to realize that most of the things that we care about with quality of life come with that development, whether it's life expectancy, infant mortality, literacy. All of these go in the, the same direction. Uh, and, but at least conceptually, some people will be happier with less of a le level of economic development and more of something else. Uh, that said, the, inter the, the empirical literature that does this happiness survey stuff, I think, is all junk science. It's the equivalent of uh, me getting punched in the nose and Mike Tyson getting punched in the nose and then asking us both on a scale of 1 to 10 how much did that hurt and adding us together and averaging as if that meant anything. If everybody has a, a different scale, it's meaningless to put people together. Yeah, you know, I, just quickly, you know, um, it, is, it is a mistake to equate happiness or satisfaction with material well-being. Um, and actually, a good example of it is in the history of socialism. The Soviet Union, uh, when it was created in 1917, was uh, the Soviet people, the Russian people, got richer. They got richer very quickly. I and mean, the forced industrialization, uh, in fact, brought Russia into a more modern industrial the capacity grew and so forth. But it immiserated people. I mean, so they developed in a, in a, in a very real way. They killed 50 million people. But they, the, the country developed, and people got richer in, in a lot of material ways. But uh, I don't think too many of them were happier. Uh, so it, is, it's, it goes both ways, I guess what I'm saying. You can develop and, get, and have happy people developing, but you can also develop in, in a way that, that, that really creates a lot of misery along the way. The, the means matter a lot. Having said that, uh it is also true that the happiness literature finds that as countries grow richer, people get happier. That's true. I see, I, it doesn't I mean guess. it's not junk. <laughs> <laughs> that may be so, but the actual literature does uh, find that if you are willing to take that literature seriously. We'll take one more question uh, from the front here. Uh, wait for the microphone, please. Uh, I teach economics at the Georgia Mason University. 
Uh, when you think about it, uh, socialism is simply a silly idea. This is not what I say. I have no authority to say that. This is what James Buchanan told me in personal conversation. And he was saying this because when he was in his 20s, he said he was sort of a romantic you know, uh, a socialist. Uh, nevertheless, say, let's say he was a 20 in 1950 or 40. Now, you know, looks like uh, people have become interested again in the idea of socialism. Why? Because socialism appeals to our reason or because it appeals to our emotion. Uh, if I remember what uh, Gustave uh, Le Bon said, uh, what kind of people become interested in socialism? Uh, and he says, uh, uh, people who cannot adjust to find his place in modern civilization, and then you know, they tend to become socialist. And what is their purpose? Simply destroy uh, the institution we have. In, in other words, it's destroy the civilization. Uh, and he said that there is no answer for that. You know, uh, so what do you think uh, if there is no answer for all? Oh, he said the cause is because most of the people are indifferent to this problem. And he's, he says that the only thing we can do is uh, be patient, don't panic, but keep on tolerate, keep on living with it. So I wonder if you have any answer to in Gustave Le Bon's uh, pessimism. So, and this is related to the happiness question as well. Um, recently, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said that, that her generation had never known authentic prosperity, which those of us that, that crunch numbers, and I think Bob Lawson could, could help us with this, but um, by any conceivable measure, we are living in the most prosperous, most opportunistic, most beautiful times in the history of the universe. But understanding the context for, for, for which she can say something like that. She grew up watching Wall Street get bailed out. She, her generation grew up uh, saddled with twenty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 worth of, of college debt. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of reasons why, from her perspective, things could suck, even though things are the best they've ever been. So appreciating the context of where people are coming from, I think, I think is, is part of the key of understanding why they, they think socialism might be better. But I, I don't think it's about economics at all. And I don't think most people process the world that they live in through economic calculation, uh, facts and figures. She also famously said that it's more important to be morally right than factually correct. And we all laugh at that, but, but she's, she's making sort of a values-based point about how a lot of people that are attracted to her sort of ideas process the world. So, so understanding where the other side is coming from and not just hitting them with, with uh, that the laws of supply and demand is, is probably the first step towards, towards making that connection. Well, and I'll just say pragmatically, since we're kind of ending on this, uh, what Bob and I did is we wrote a book uh, that tried to, well, we do use the laws of supply and demand. We drink a lot of beer and try to talk to people who are, are willing to listen and might want to be entertained, but learn some economics and, and history along the way. Okay. Nice plug. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a book event. And, and where can we buy this book? <laughs> it's available on Amazon right now. Socialism sucks, Lawson and Powell. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thank you guys for joining us, and I'm looking forward to your... Uh